Uh, I'm here with fetish model Kitty Quinn. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. Of course. How did you get uh, into becoming a fetish model? Like what gave you the idea? Like you wanted to, you know, put yourself out there online, you know, sell photos, do these videos. Right. Um, okay. Well, it was kind of a funny story. Um, I was in the lifestyle as a fetishist before I ever even became a fetish model. And I was working at a dental office because I'm a retired dental office manager <laughs> and uh, my office burned down. And they fired me by a text message like two weeks later. And that was like right before FetishCon 2019. So I don't know. I was just having like this whole like universal change in my life. And I was like, you know what? I've been wanting to do this. I think I could be really good at it. Let's fuck around, find out. So that's how it happened. That's really cool. So, uh, you talk about being in the fetish world, like, you know, before you, uh, like, you know, what, what were like some of your early experiences? How did you get into like, you know, being involved in, in fetishes? Well, I mean, honestly, I, um, <clears throat> I think I always had fetishes that I didn't even necessarily recognize that I had as fetishes. But now that I've become more fluent in the language of kink, <laughs> so to speak, um, I realized that I've had a handful of fetishes for a long time and I didn't quite associate them as fetishes, but I, um, I went through, I'm a cancer survivor. So it was kind of like, I had just gotten through, you know, getting my surgery for everything with cancer. I had had a miscarriage. I was getting ready to leave my company of like 10 years. I was about to get divorced. Everything was just kind of like coming to a head. And I realized that like, you know what? even on like the best double rainbow sunny day, I'm only like 75% happy. And that is just, you can't subject yourself to a life where you're still unfulfilled, even when, you know, you're rolling sevens. So I kind of did some searching and within myself to figure out what did I need to really feel fulfilled and be happy as an individual completely. And, you know, through some therapy, and some introspect, <laughs> I realized that it was kink that I needed. It was BDSM that I had like an itch that needed to be scratched, so to speak. How does it fulfill you? Well, I mean, I'm a switch. So I, you know, I, you know, I entertain both the dominant and the submissive side of things. So it's, it's almost a release. It's an escape of sorts that Damien, get out of here. Sorry, my cat is so rude. Um, it's just kind of, it, it's an escape. It's a means of you go somewhere in your mind that is unlike any other place in this world, in my opinion. And you kind of, it's just an experience, the feeling that it's, because for me, it, it's a lot more about psychological than physical, as far as, you know, what really, really scratches my itch. But, um, you know, it's just, it's a beautiful thing that it can just bring you such fulfillment and such happiness and, you know, it can help you get through trauma. So there's, you know, there's just a lot of really good things that it's good for like anybody. And it kind of just depends on the person as to like what you find most fulfilling, if that makes sense. For sure. And, you know, you have a bunch of different fetishes that you advertise. Like I was looking at your mini vids page and you talk about, specializing in sneakers can you talk a little bit about like you know uh what what about sneakers <laughs> okay sneakers this is a fetish that i i didn't even really anticipate becoming such a huge part of my life um it was it, early on in my career it was only about a year or so into it i had a fan that really just had a penchant for me in Converse Chuck Taylors. And, you know, Chuck Taylors are, that's the second most researched sneaker for porn, only seconded by the Nike Air Force One. But I, he kind of just, he started buying me Converse and he started ordering customs. And, you know, I really, I leaned into it. I really enjoyed it because, you know, I, I love wearing sneakers. Like, I, I you know, I'm, I'm kind of a sneaker kind of chick anyway. I mean, I love my heels and I love all shoes, but, 
day to day, I do love wearing sneakers. So um, the audience kind of just found me. It kind of just cultivated itself. And then before I knew it, I had, you know, 25 pairs of Converse and I had fans calling me the queen of Converse, which I still think is like wildly insane to even say out loud myself, but <laughs> whatever. So, you know, I've, I've researched a lot into sneaker fetish and I've learned and I've dug into the brains of some of my fans and it's a very, it's a very interesting fetish that, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to it, of course, as with any fetish, but I've just found it to be, I mean, it's one of my top three, definitely one of my top three favorite fetishes to shoot. And I really just have the most fun with it. And like, I thank God my fans want to see me wear sneakers all day and not stilettos. Like, thank you, sweet Jesus. That worked out in my favor. <laughs> I was looking at you do giantess work, but like, uh, you look very petite. You look very small. Like, so <laughs> I am, I mean, I'm relatively as a general in general female population. Yes. I'm rather, I'm relatively petite. I'm five foot six, I'm about 130 pounds. I've got a relatively petite frame in the world of fetish modeling. They always tend to tell me, they're like, Oh my God, you are so tall. And I'm like, that's just because like most of the girls I work with, they're all like five foot nothing and they all have like size 10 feet. And I'm just like, I'm just like a normally proportioned person. I'm average height with the normal, most common average shoe size. <laughs> but Giantess is really fun. That's all with the angles. It's all with the camera work. And really Giantess I find is, it's one of the fetishes you really get to dig into the plots and the scripts and the dialogue. and you know, I'm very well known for the quality of my dialogue and my improv in, in clips. So I really get to have a lot of fun with Giant Tess. I still don't entirely understand it. I'm not even going to lie, though. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still picking brains of my fans to really, like, grasp it as a whole, because I don't entirely understand it, to be truthful with you. Yeah, one of the things I was really impressed about is just, like, you know, the quality of your videos. And you have, like, you know, so many videos, like, I think like I was looking at mini vids, you got something like 216 videos, you know, uh, how much work goes into like, you know, social media creating this content. Oh, so much work. And I mean, many vids, oh my God, that's not even like half my content. I, I have to update many vids. I haven't put anything up there in forever. All my stuff's on clips for sale and loyal fans, but either way, I've been accumulating content since I started, since the day I got into this business, I started accumulating content. I still have content. I haven't even released that I created back in like 2019, 2020, 2021. Wow. But, you know, it's just, that's what I love about doing what I do. I get to wear so many hats. I get to, you know, be a model and a performer in front of the camera, which wow. I've always had, you know, a, a love for performing. And, you know, I get to come up with really unique and creative scripts and ideas. I get to do the framing and the lighting and the wardrobe and I do all of, I'm a one, I'm a one shop stop kind of chick. I don't outsource any of, you know, my editing or my posting or have other people run certain platforms for me. If you see me online, you're, you're talking to me. You're not talking to somebody else. I'm the one doing it. If you're watching my content, I created it. If I didn't film it myself, I paid somebody to film it for me. And I did all of the editing. I made the GIF. I wrote the descriptions. It's a very labor intensive, you know, it's it's a labor of love, <laughs> so to speak. There's a lot that goes into it with just the creating, the editing, the posting, and then the promoting alone. You know what I mean? There's just like endless platforms to constantly keep updated and stay relevant on and, you know, try to not get shadow banned on. <laughs> is, is that... Um you know, a real thing, like, you know, I've heard, like, you know, a lot of, like, um, just hypocrisy on, like, you know, some of the social media platforms, like Instagram. Uh, have you experienced any of that? Oh, oh, 1010%. Ironically, you even say Instagram, particularly as the reference point, because Instagram doesn't like me. <laughs> Clearly, I had my original account, which, look, I... I worked for corporate America for over 10 years as a manager. I love rules. I love handbooks. Give me the guidelines. I will follow them to the T to the death. Not a problem. As long as I know like why I'm doing it. 
And I was, I was always very, I'm, I'm very respectful of terms of service on any and every platform I'm on, whether I agree with their terms of service or not. Look, I, I need them to help me help them, help them help me. So, you know, I, I try to abide by them. I randomly was deleted on my main Instagram. I had created a backup about a year before that because we had gone through, there was a big wave of sex workers getting you know, deleted and reported on Instagram, there was like a mass, mass amount of accounts lost at that time. And so I had my backup account and I never really did too much with it until finally they deleted my original account. And I was devastated because it was like 2022, 2023. And I had amassed like three or four years of, you know, content and contacts. And, um, I was devastated. I, I don't even think I like touched my backup account for like a month and a half because I was just like, oh, first world problems. Woe is me. But um, at the end, I then got that one deleted. I tried to make a third one. I put my name in. I put an avatar, not even my person, just a drawing of a face, just literally clavicle up. You can't even see cleavage. Had not posted a thing, had not searched a thing literally had just said yes I verified my account this is me and they were like Henry stop it they were like yell at my cat and um they deleted me just like that I hadn't looked at anything I hadn't done anything I literally hadn't even seen the the initial like scroll your timeline feed and I was deleted like that now it won't let me make it I, I've tried it from every like phone laptop computer in my house and I I guess maybe I'll have to get like a VPN maybe to like get another one but they will not even let me make a new account for anything no matter what it is on Instagram so I got Instagram banned unfortunately I guess which is lame but and overall I mean sex workers in general we we do get we take a lot of heat in general. We are one of the communities that are easily targeted and tend to be the first targeted in things like this that happen just because, I mean, for some people it's like low hanging fruit. Do you know what I mean? Because it's yeah. a polarizing, you know, profession. And there are people that, there are people that absolutely love us, adore us, support us, do everything with us. And there are people that we really, we really trigger deeply bad triggers for them like we we really wake up something upsetting in them and I respect it either way I just don't respect when we can't all you know respect each other mutually and let each other just kind of like do our thing and just like live our life as humans <laughs> no 100% and that like you know reminds me of like you know what happened like you know with Pornhub you know, in Texas and like, basically like, you know, they like, you know, passed the law, like where they were going to require uh, age verification and Pornhub just decided to leave Texas. You know, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, that is a whole can of worms to, oh my God, we can seriously get sidetracked on that. You can get yeah. me going for like an hour on that. I mean, at the end of the day, the only thing I can really say about it is I've always been a fan of some form of regulation. I, I I like accountability because at the end of the day, content that I make, there's a lot of content I make. It, it doesn't, I there's no eyeballs under the age of 18, maybe even under the age of 21 at times, depending on their level of maturity, you know, that that belong, you know, watching or engaging in the content that me and my colleagues produce, to be honest with you. So I have zero tolerance for minors engaging watching anything like that i get kids are going to be curious do their thing not on my watch not on my content so I, I want it to be accountable i do i desperately want that because that would give me and a lot of people i know would give us peace of mind knowing that that's just not a concern not something that is a back burner worry that is going to happen but i don't have the solution i don't even have a suggestion for a solution of how to create that accountability in a fair and just manner that that isn't imposing on the rights and the freedoms of an American citizen. I don't have the solution for that. I would love for somebody to figure it out. I don't think what the direction they were going with 
with the whole ban and the age verification and the Texas thing, I don't think the details of that were going to be a proper solution at the end of the day. Most definitely. I was uh, looking at like um, your your Twitter feed, I think like, you know, uh, or, or your YouTube channel. And you were talking about like, you know, uh, fetish con, like questions they have for you. And you were saying like, you know, how you had been involved going to fetish con, like you mentioned previously, like, you know, before you uh, became a model. And then uh, you also said you were attacked once at fetish con. I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about that. Oh my God. It's just like, it's just people get excited. I, like, I don't like, it wasn't like attacked, attacked. It's just people come out of the woodworks and they get like, they just get excitable. Like I know other people, Whitney Morgan has told me some wild stories and I think maybe I have some of her stories on one of my episodes of YouTube that I put out. Maybe I don't, did I even release that one? I've got to check. But either way, she knows people that have been like actually like aggressively like attacked, like assaulted, attacked. I just, the main experience that I recall that was really jarring was it was like a dude that I met on a dating app. Like I didn't even actually meet him in person. We didn't even like go on a date. <laughs> But like we like matched and talked a little bit on a dating app like four years before he ran into me at FetishCon. And it was just bizarre because he just kind of like came out of the woodwork and he called me by my legal name. So like huge no no. Oh right. No no. Especially in, you know, the location where we're at with FetishCon. At the end of the day, doxing is a huge issue for all sex workers. We, you know, we have to protect our privacy 100%. with, you know, with our life because it can come down to your life, unfortunately, because people get Looney Tunes about things. But at the end of the day, I just, I it, like, it, I, it caught me very off guard because I hear somebody like yelling my, and I was just like, I like stopped in my tracks and I just didn't, I was like, uh, and I turned and I looked. And he was surprised because I actually remembered his ass. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I remember. This was your first name. This is your last name. You worked here down in this area about 45 minutes away, right? And he's like, oh, wow, you remember. And I was like, yeah, don't ever, ever say my name like that in a location like this if I am doing my work. Don't ever, ever do that again. Thanks, bye, pretty much. But that was really, really awkward. And I mean, the only time I got physically attacked, I hate even like talking about it. Um, there was a girl that she's a model that isn't local anymore. She kind of just made a brief in and out of the industry. She had a lot of personal issues she needs to deal with. Um, she did put her hands on me at the pool party. And um, she like, she actually, she's like, I she like molested me practically. She like tried to like grab my boobs. And I'm like, what are you doing, girlfriend? Like, what is going on? You're violating me. And she was trying to just, she was trying to provoke me and start a fight. So she was pushing me and, you know, shoving into me and trying to grab me and was just saying really obnoxious, silly things to me. And um, it was unfortunate for her because she didn't, you know, get that reaction that she was desperately trying to get out of me but it was also unfortunate that she didn't get kicked out that she only got like told to say just like hey by the way stop being an asshole but you know to each their own at the end of the day luckily I had some good friends that were near me that you know are in the industry that were there to make sure I stayed safe and I didn't get injured or anything and I didn't get provoked into like catching a charge for putting my hands on somebody not worth it. So at the end of the day, it really wasn't too much of an incident. It was just more or less just jarring because like, I just, I don't have people put their hands on me. It's just not like a common thing I deal with. <laughs> Right. Like, you know, uh, especially like, you know, not without like your consent or like, you know, in a, a pleasant way, you would imagine, like, <laughs> you know, well, yeah, uh, grabbing my boobs and be, like making fun of the size of my boobs in comparison to yours. I just I, I I felt really violated was the thing. It was just a very it was just a very uncomfortable situation just because we were like it was a public place. There were fans. There were people, professionals. It was just it was just very took me very, very off guard because I mean. I'm not typically one to, you know, I don't engage in shit like that. <laughs> and uh, your your boobs are a very nice size, like, you know, so <laughs> like, I don't know what her problem was, but you know, you talked about doxing. Uh, you know, 
you know, being a sex worker, like, you know, being online, uh, do you, do you, is that a concern? Is this something that has happened? Like, you know, people putting out your private information? Um, fortunately, you know, knock on wood, I haven't had it happen to me. Um, I have not been a victim of doxing. I am friends with and have worked with multiple girls who have been victim of doxing. I mean, one of my best friends has been doxxed at one point. So, you know, it's it's a very unfortunate thing. Um, it is something that it's a back burner concern in my mind for sure. You know what I mean? I I, I don't, you know, go out handing out my my personal name. I had to go and make my personal Instagram private after I did this because I was like, there's like a ton of stuff that I'm basically doxing myself. And if somebody just happens to see it, they're right. gonna be able to look through my personal stuff. So it was kind of weird having to like change some of my stuff that was personal to private after so many years. Cause I'm just not really private in that way. I'm just kind of like an open book kind of girl, but, um, I don't, you know, I know a lot of girls that really put a lot of weight into their concern for doxing and it don't get me wrong. It is a very huge concern and can be very damaging, but honestly, it doesn't really, I don't think about it too, too much. I do what I can to take the steps to protect myself from putting myself in a position to be doxxed. But, you know, I kind of, it's one of those things where I look at it like, like content being pirated. Right. Do I, do I hate that people pirate my content? Yes. But the minute I put a video out, I don't even have to post it. I can just send it to a person. You order a custom from me. I send it to you immediately. That can be anywhere in the world forever. And can be resold, redone, whatever can happen to it. So it's once you put anything video out into the world, transferring it from your device to another, or you're not even taking it off your device for fuck's sake, you know, you're at that point, you're at the risk of something being pirated. You're at the risk of something being seen by somebody you don't want it to be seen by, which is why I always say, if you're going to regret it, don't film it. If you don't want somebody to see it, don't film it because you have no control once the content's out there. Right. So I kind of look at doxing like that, where it's just, it's kind of like, it, it's a shitty cost of business as a consequence. That is a possibility that you can do your best to avoid, but sometimes no matter what you do, it just, it's going to bite you in the ass. With, you Hopefully. know, the amount of pirated content, cause you know, Reddit, like a lot of like, you know, people post like content on Reddit and, uh, is there ever been something that you were ashamed that you you filmed or nope. just like you regret it? I can't say that I have. Um, see, when I first started in this industry, one thing, you know, I thought about it for a year and a half before I even pulled the trigger, before I even got fired, I was thinking about it. And, you know, I considered what would anybody I know think about it? If I did this, would that make me change my course? If somebody said I was going to disown you or cut you out of my life, or I am going to monstracize you for what you're doing, um, I came to the conclusion that I'm gonna be, I'm gonna make stuff that I'm proud of, and I'm never going to compromise myself. And I stayed true to myself in that promise, and I've never compromised myself because, like I said, you know, once you film it there's no control. So if it's something that you're going to be like ashamed of or embarrassed by in a way that is, you know, damaging or detrimental to you, then, you know, you just shouldn't film it. So, you know, I have, I mean, if anything, I'm like ashamed of like the quality of my content four years ago because I didn't have good enough lighting <laughs> because like I didn't have like a clean enough set, like that type of stuff. Yes. But no, I've never done anything on film as Kitty Quinn that I can't stand behind and say, you know, I'm proud of my work. Oh, so was there like stuff on film before you were Kitty Quinn that you did that maybe? I mean, nothing comes to mind. I really didn't do too much racy stuff on film. It's probably just more or less like me doing dumbass shit, like just being like an idiot and embarrassing myself by like, falling on my face or making a horrifically awful face or doing something stupid but no there's really no good I mean shit I would love it if somebody would find something interesting I'd be like oh my god that would be cool because like just I, I can't think of anything interesting like I don't have any good like oh shit I hope that never surfaces kind of thing like I mean I'm sure some of the amateur brief sexy videos I've done with former partners are probably 
you know, they're not like particularly flattering because I wasn't concerned about like angles or lighting at the moment. So like, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be like, oh, yay, there's a gif of that on the internet. But at the same time, I wouldn't have a problem making money off of it because there's an entire audience for an amateur production. And, you know, there's an audience for everything. That's why I have such a massive variety of fetishes that I shoot. That way I can target a ton of people and help people in that way. And I can, you know, just not get bored, not do one thing all of the time. Like I get to spice it up with a lot of variety. Uh, do you feel the money is worth it? Absolutely. <clears throat> I make, I mean, I make very good money. I make good enough money to support myself. Um, I was still delivering like Uber Eats and DoorDash and Postmates for the first like six or seven weeks that I did this because I wasn't making money yet. <laughs> and I was just committed to being full time. That's it. I'm not doing anything else. So I was like, I'm giving it a hundred percent, see if it's going to happen or not. And um, I mean, I'd say I, I probably put in more hours now than I ever did, you know, as a corporate office manager, but it's more satisfying. It's, and I think that's as anything, if it's your own business, um, the money I think is really worth it. I, I don't take gigs if I don't think the pay is going to be worth what you're asking me to do. I, I'm more than happy to politely decline and possibly refer you to somebody I might know that might be up their alley. But, you know, I, I'm happy with the money I make. Do I aspire to make more? Absolutely. Am I working my butt off to, like, make sure that I build my sites and my content so I can continue to make more and more money? Absolutely. But I'm really proud of the fact that I can support myself entirely mm -hmm. off of supporting myself doing this work, doing selling my worn items, taking customs, taking paid shoots, selling my content, sexting, all of the different avenues. Cause there's a lot of baskets my eggs are in, <laughs> but that way I'm not, you know, up Shit's Creek. Like when, when the whole thing with only fans happened, how many girls were like devastated because they had put everything in their life into only fans and nothing else. Luckily for me, you know, I've got six sites that I can say, okay, cool. Well, like, only fans taking a ship this week. At least I still have closer sale island clips, many vids, loyal fans, all of those. So, you know, I, I think it's good to put your, you know, your money in everywhere you can and you just keep building it. And like I said, I mean, you get to decide what jobs you want to take. You know what I mean? You get to decide what rate you feel your value is. And then, you know, the producers will confirm or deny your value to them in that way. But I do like there's a lot of autonomy and independence in doing this. And, you know, you really get to work on your terms. And I I really like that. I've never really been good with, like, authority. I'm better as, like, the person giving me authority. <laughs> That's really great. Uh, you were talking earlier, you know, about surviving cancer. You know, what was the most difficult part of that journey? And how did you overcome it? Uh... The most difficult part of that was honestly post-op um, The because they found it. I was at, I had a tissue issue on my shoulder. It was called dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, AKA a fucking mouthful. But luckily, you know, I live close to an amazing hospital at Moffitt where there are brilliant, talented doctors and staff there. And um I was able, the treatment itself wasn't truly very terrifying because um, I've never, I've never been one to be terrified of anesthesia, like going under. It was, you know, they were able to do it just with one surgery. I would, luckily didn't have to go through chemo or anything, but like the scariest and hardest part was when the day I came back after a week later after my surgery and my front desk quit on me. And I had to work 50 to 60 hour weeks solo for about six months while it was healing with 13 staples in my shoulder. Um, so that was really hard. And I got through that with like, you know, a lot of just being tenacious and having really good dirty Arnold Palmer cocktails after work. <laughs> for sure. Um, why did you uh, choose the stage name Kitty Quinn? 
it sounds okay. This sounds so stupid when I say it because everybody has their story about, you know, how did you come up with your name? And I don't really have like some brilliant, like connective story. If you've ever seen the movie Boogie Nights with Mark Wahlberg, um, classic, he has this moment where he's, I think he's like sitting in a hot tub with like John C. Riley or something. And he just like has this moment where he comes up with his porn name and it's Dirk Diggler. And it just like blows up in like neon lights in his head. And the ne the neon lights are so like wild, they explode. Well, I was sitting at my local Kava and Kratom bar and, you know, I was thinking about it. And I, I mean, I came up with my name probably at least like six months before I actually pulled the trigger to do this. And I just, it came to me and I was like, Kitty Quinn, Kitty fucking Quinn. Oh God, that sounds really good. That rolls off the tongue. I'm, as you can tell by my cats around me, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a cat lady of, you know, undeniable degree. And I do have a lot of very feline personality traits, as I've been told and can recognize in some. So that kind of comes natural. I did have a couple of friends that called me Kitty. So that kind of just slipped. And um, I'm a big fan of Harley Quinn. I can't deny it. That is one of the main female comic book characters that I can deeply relate to. And I've read like the origin stories about her. I read a really good book, Mad Love, about her. And it, it sounds crazy when I'm like, I can relate to her because she's fucking batshit crazy. But <laughs> there's just a lot of different aspects of the character in general that I that just kind of resonate with me so it kind of just it it stuck in my head and that's what I registered as the first in 2019 when I went to FetCon that year as my first you know FetCon is Kitty Quinn and I should have done some research because there's already a Kitty Quinn so I definitely picked a name that somebody already has I think there's actually two other Kitty Quinns um really gorgeous girls really sexy really beautiful girls they make amazing content so like cheers for them but yeah no I definitely um didn't research it and say let me come up with something unique I just came up with it on my own I was like I like that is that kind of confusing like you know because like uh, I was googling and I, I did come across like the other kitty quins and I was wondering I was like oh like it's I got probably the cosplay one there's a local girl she's from around here and she does a ton of really really amazing cosplay and I think she's the one that actually has kittyquinn.com which Whenever she's ready to sell it, girl, I'm ready to buy that from you. Thank you very much. But um, I, I know there's occasionally it, it, people do. If you look up Kitty Quinn, I have not been the five years I've put in is just not quite enough yet to have built the mass to be quickly maybe like the first thing that you find. I don't think I'm usually like right around there, but. I think it's the one girl because she does mainstream. She does more like triple X porn. The one Kitty Quinn that I've gotten confused for once or twice. Somebody like voted for her for AVN and they like tagged my account. And we're like, I voted. I was like, oh my God, you're so sweet. But you didn't vote for me. You meant her. And I'm going to go vote for her too now. <laughs> um, I haven't had too much issue with confusion, typically speaking. I mean... It's not too hard. If you if you want to find me on the internet, it's not, you know, too terribly difficult to find me. But, you know, I'm I'm working my ass off to be the first pop up on the search page. And one day I'm going to be that you watch. Are you uh, open to doing more mainstream adult work like, you know, for other like big studios? Um, You know, I, I never say never. I don't necessarily see me doing, you know, mainstream boy girl stuff anytime in the near future because I just, I really love doing fetish. I have so much fun doing fetish and I just really, really love what I do with it that right now I'm not really seeking different avenues in the industry, um, but, you know, it, it's possible. I've never, never been against it. You know, I've discussed doing it more for my own site even and just doing privately doing more, you know, boy, girl and stuff like that. But I just end up when I have the time, I'm like, oh, but I've got like 75 good scripts in my notebook that I haven't even gotten to film yet. Wow. And like, if I'm going to bang you, like sometimes I'm like, honey, like I would just rather like 
Like, let's just like have fun and like, let's like, I don't have to be Kitty Quinn with lights on and makeup on and making sure I'm getting the good angle instead of just like really getting it in. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe I might one day, you never know. But I, for right now, I'd say you can kind of stick on like, you can bet on me sticking with fetish for at least the next couple years, I would imagine. But, you know, things change day to day. You never know. Definitely. Uh, what's next for you? What's next for me? I mean, I'd say really what's next for me is just, it's kind of just to keep chugging along. Like I, I'm trying to really build my, you know, myself as a producer. I've put in a lot of footwork, ooh, pun intended. Um, you know, building my name and my brand as a model. And I am now my main focus is I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm really trying to increase my production value, increase my abilities with with editing, with just general production, with framing, with lighting, with, you know, all things involved, because I've had some people buy customs from me and they don't necessarily even have me in the custom. They purchase a custom from me for other models. Now, as any woman, the first time that happened, I was super offended. And I was like, <laughs> but wait, you don't want to see my tits? What's wrong with you? That is so wrong, right? I but definitely then I was, do, yeah. Like, <laughs> right? I mean, like anybody, it would be like your vanity suddenly is just like, ah, you don't want to see me? Why? And, you know, I mean, as a performer, of course, you know, that's, it's it's hurtful initially. But then I thought about it. And, you know, at the end of the day, look, I'm happy to stay in this industry until I'm a gilf. I have <laughs> mad love and respect for the Leilani Lees and the Sandra Silvers of the world. They are queens. And I hope to God people still want to jerk off to me when I'm like 75. Like I am down AF. But, you know, there may come a day when people don't necessarily, you know, want to see me in front of the camera. I don't know. Maybe it could happen. but. Like, you know, my boobs can sag, my face can wrinkle, but my production value will never decrease. It can become stagnant if I choose to let it. But to me, somebody wanting my content because of the way that I produce it, the way that it comes out, the result you get more than wanting me necessarily, that's actually like the hugest compliment as a content creator. Like that's that is like that stuff is what gives me the push when I'm like flustered because something I put a lot into just didn't, you know, it just didn't hit really well with the audience and it didn't sell well. And I thought it was going to be like a killer. Um, it's moments like that that, you know, keep me pushing. So I'm like, you know what? Everything I'm doing, all this painstaking, detailed work, it's worth it because there are people that appreciate what I'm putting out. And there are people that, have been fans and have watched my content evolve and have enjoyed watching it develop and still order customs from me. And it, I think it's great. So I'd say that's what's next for me is just really building, you know, Kitty Quinn fetish as a brand and a like as a producer. Most definitely. Kitty Quinn, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you. Uh, you're a very talented artist and thank it was, you. It was really nice speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Anytime. I'd love to have you back. Absolutely.